I want to offer you all a very warm welcome for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here tonight. When I was making announcements in the other room, I should have said, and by the way, the longer you spend in this room, the closer you sit to the front. <laughs> but I didn't make that announcement. So tonight, um, I'm really excited about the beginning of a new series, a Learning in the Brain series this year. I'm excited because I think the topic is really relevant. And I'm excited because we've been doing this, many, some of us, for four years together. And, um, and so I think we've reached a point where we can, can dig in a little more, that we can look a little more deeply at strategies and ideas for parenting um, that link to the executive functioning. So tonight is a kickoff and sort of a laying the base for the sessions that are going to run throughout this year. And at the end of this evening, you're going to have a chance with a ticket out the door, a little fill-in form, to tell me of all the different executive functions that you get introduced to tonight, what are you most interested in knowing more about? And then as we go forward, we'll try to pick those ones that most people um, are interested in. I just want to do a little bit of a survey, though. How many folks are here tonight from junior school? Hands up. Awesome. And middle school? and senior school. See, this is what I love. It's the cross-section of the whole school coming together. How many parents are here tonight who are new to St. Michael's? This is your first time. Welcome. Awesome. This is what we do for fun. <laughs> how, many of us, how many of you are guests or friends, community friends of, of a SMU person? Welcome to you as well. Great to have you joining us for tonight. How many of you have been at previous sessions and have come back? Oh, see, I love that. I'm always worried. Ask my husband. I don't sleep for a few nights before these ones. Anyway, I'm excited when people want to come back. What I want to kind of really stress about tonight and about these sessions, if you're new to them, is that we design, this is a bit of a cone of parenthood. <laughs> um, we design it as a space for thinking and learning and questioning together. My name is Heather Clayton. I'm the Director of Learning, and I work primarily with faculty K through 12 here at the school to look at practice and look at research and how that fits with what we're doing daily in the classroom. Both in that role and in this, I think it's really important as adults that we do have spaces where we can kind of wonder and question and not worry about judgment or feeling badly. And so tonight particularly, as we look at executive functioning skills, um, I want us to really just sort of dig in and say, okay, where do we stand on this? What's happening in our family? Um, what can I learn from this that might be helpful to me tomorrow or next week? And if we do that together, I think it's really, really powerful. I had the opportunity this summer. I, I, I love my job here for sure, and my primary job is as a mom. And my children now are 24, 22, and almost 19. I know, I don't look a day over 20, but that's where they are. And um, I had the chance this summer to travel. They're all living in Ontario. One is married, going to school, and so on, to spend some time with them this summer and to listen to them talk. And some of them... A couple of them were wrestling with some really tricky decisions. And to sort of listen to them process and think, wow, they're kind of grown up. Like they've moved on. They're working this stuff through. And there's a bitter sweetness in that that comes for us as parents, right? This is our job, to help our kids grow to independence. And when they do, we kind of go, yay. <laughs> what does that all mean? So tonight, as we're looking at executive functioning skills, that's really what we're talking about helping our kids from the time that they're teeny until they leave our home to grow more and more independent. And that's, that's the exciting part of parenthood, and that's where we're going to go tonight. So what are, we gonna, what are our goals for tonight? We're going to work together to try and define executive skills. Um, we're going to utilize a tool, which I'll be sharing with you shortly, to look at our own strengths and challenges within executive functioning. Remember that cone of learning together and no judgment? And also, we're going to look at the role of parenting and some strategies that will support uh, the executive skill development. You'll notice that you see executive skills, executive functioning skills, executive function. I, as I was reading material, it can be called by different things. So as, as long as you get a couple of those words together, we're talking about the same thing. Okay, executive skills or executive function. Um, the, the, 
first bit that I want to do, though, is to sort of set a context for us. Um, as I said, it's our goal as parents and as, our, as teachers to help our kids to grow independently, to go independently into the sunset. Um, and their independence comes by degrees relative to their development and their experience. Last year, we had something here, those of you who are familiar, we have a Brain Awareness Week. We've had two now, we'll have another this year, where the whole community for a week celebrates in understanding what we know about the brain. Last year's speaker spoke to the parents. We'll do that again this year as well. Frank Cross, some of you may have heard him. And when he was here, he really stressed this idea of executive functioning skills. And as I was driving him back to the hotel in the evening, we were chatting and he said to me, Heather, these skills will be the curriculum 10 years from now. The actual content that our kids know can be Googled. <laughs> it's these skills that we want our kids to have that will help them when they're on teams and they have to get to work and they have to prioritize and all of those various skills. So that got us thinking. And there are a number of faculty at the school, too, have a really deep and keen interest in this. And so we are, as a faculty, a, a small group of faculty, going to work this year in looking at where are we already in school supporting these skills and where else do we want to think about doing that work. And we thought it made perfect sense for us to spend the time in our parent sessions also focusing on this because we believe so strongly in the partnerships that we share with you. So that's a context of why we're going down this path. I want you to just uh, spend a minute or so chatting with someone beside you about what you actually think executive functions are when we're talking about that. And if you don't know, that's fine. But just talk together and see what you come up with. What, what did you come up with? Someone just give me a, you know, something. Give me something. What, what did you come up with? Uh, something you talked about. Decision making. OK, awesome. Thank you. What else? I heard time management and organization. Say that again. Yeah. Oh, are you guys looking at the list? You know, there isn't that big of a difference between students and their parents, just saying. Or their teachers, or their teachers. <laughs> OK, anything else that you want to add that came up with that isn't just reading that list? Some communication. OK, some communication. Something else? Multitasking. Multitasking. Prioritization, yeah. Nice. Nice. OK. It's a great list. And a number of the pieces, as you know, because you were reading, um, we'll be discussing as we go along um, and, and looking at these various functions and trying to, trying to sort of understand them in a, in a deeper way. All right. So just a couple of assumptions before we sort of dive in to begin to define and, and hear what executive functioning skills are. Um, we want to remember a couple of things. We want to remember that everybody demonstrates a wide range of, of these skills. Okay, So it isn't that somebody's good at everything. It's that often there's an area or two that we all struggle in. Um, and the other thing that's really important about identifying ch challenges, whether it's in the context of executive function or really anywhere, is that that awareness just allows us to build some strategies to support the weakness. Right? It's not a place to sort of feel badly and get down and be negative and critical. It's a place to say, OK, if I know that that's a challenge, what can I do to support that and strengthen that? All right, so those are the assumptions we're going to bring with us. Um, Harvard has done a lot of work on a variety of child development. And I thought it would be really great um, to share with you just a very short video that they, where they talk about executive functions. Um, I was running this earlier. It's obviously always fine when you run it ahead. And then the sinking started to go out a bit. So we'll see how we go. You might have to just close your eyes and listen if it bothers you too much. Science tells us that brains, 
Minds are built, not born. And at the center of this dynamic architecture are a set of skills called executive function and self-regulation. Children's self-regulation and executive function are key ingredients in their lifetime performance. It's not just about learning language or learning numbers or learning colors. We have to be able to work effectively with others, with distractions, with multiple demands. These actually are skills that contribute to the productivity of the American workforce. What should you have done next? Educators, I think, are, are looking for just this sort of thing. And when we describe what we mean by executive function, they say, yes, that's it. That's exactly, you know, the problem. These kids, they can tell me these rules, but they can't actually use them. What's this? Um, a toolbox. A toolbox. What is executive function? Goggles. Probably the best way to think about it is sort of like an air traffic control system in the brain. Just like an air traffic control system has to manage lots of airplanes going on lots of runways and really exquisite timing and so on, a child has to manage a lot of information and avoid distractions. We really think of it as involving working memory and inhibitory control and mental flexibility. Take a situation where a child is having to take turns. So first of all, the child has to have inhibitory control. The child has to be able to stop whatever he or she is doing and let the other child take a turn. But when it's your turn again, you also have to remember what it is you're supposed to be doing. So that pulls on working memory. If the children who are taking the turns after you do something unpredictable, you have to be able to adjust what you're going to do next. And that requires mental flexibility. Children who are struggling with these capacities um, often look like children who just aren't paying attention or children who are deliberately not controlling themselves. Oh. If you don't have self-regulation, you act out and the teacher puts you in timeout and so then you miss part of the learning that's going on and then you are more upset because you're behind and so you act out and so you get this downward spiral. How does executive function develop? In little children, and even you know, in the infant and toddler years, you begin to see the roots of executive functioning skills. What's going on in our brains is unbelievably intricate and complicated. The prefrontal cortex, or the front third of the brain, is important for executive function. But it's more than just prefrontal cortex. This region doesn't act alone. It's involved in controlling your behavior through its interactions with all other parts of the brain. The brain goes from a situation where you've got nearest neurons communicating very strongly with each other and ignoring the rest of the brain to these widespread networks that are connecting these different areas. Executive function changes over the life course. It improves radically over the first few years. I got a match uh, It continues to improve throughout adolescence. It's not until early adulthood that you have the adult type networks that are very strongly activated that connect different brain regions together. Let's take notes. Also, we believe that executive functions can be trained. It's just like going to the gym. So the more you practice in these areas, the stronger the capacity is likely to become because you're helping to strengthen those neural connections. Mom, you're at 24. Slowly but surely, you're going to be able to step back, and that child's going to go into the world with these skills where they can get along with other people, change rules, and they can be flexible, and they can accomplish new things, and they're unafraid. I got bit by my dog in my arm.
Oh, what? Yeah. If we don't learn these skills during the childhood and adolescent years when they're coming online, we are really ill-equipped as an adult to hold a job, to maintain a marriage, <laughs> to raise children, to get along with each other, to basically be part of a civil society. You're okay. All right. There we go. Just turn the lights back on. That was magical. <laughs> Great. So as, as uh, they were speaking to us from Harvard, they really took those um, ideas that we all had together and boiled them down into sort of three main areas, working memory, inhibitory control, and the idea of mental flexibility. We'll talk a little more as we go along, but I thought that was an interesting um, trio that they pulled out and, and really emphasized in terms of functionality and future. Uh, so just so that we can land somewhere in our understanding of what we, how we want to define executive function, there are uh, a couple of books that I've used extensively for tonight called Smart But Scattered. A couple of these will be in the draw, actually. Um, but I have referenced them all over the place. And so one of these um, definitions comes from that book, where they talk about it being a brain-based uh, skill required for humans to effectively uh, execute, perform tasks, or solve problems. So you can see that there's a lot even built in just to that sentence. Um, the National Association for Learning Disabilities has a different but similar definition. Both really important when we think about all the different processes that we want our kids to be able to do in order to move um, to that independence. You think about even something as simple as a child going to get a glass of milk. And, and I, I read this and I was like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. So if a child's going to get a glass of milk, um, they have to first of all decide that they're thirsty, go into the kitchen and get it. So that's the first thing. Get a glass from the cupboard, put it on the counter, open the fridge and get the milk, close the fridge, that's key. Um, pour the milk, which is also key, then return the milk to the fridge. And then you, they can either drink it on the spot or take it somewhere. But if they take it, you know what might happen then. So they're, they're making that decision. And just to do that, just to get a glass of milk out of the fridge, they have to kind of, you know, they open the cupboard to get the glass and they're like, oh, there's chips in here. Or I mean, you probably don't have that, but there's chips in here. Or, and then as you go further down, you know, they look into the fridge for milk, but there's this really cool, sweet, syrup syrupy drink in there, which you probably also don't have, that they might be tempted to take. And so they're making all of these decisions and inhibiting some, some actions that they may want to take. That's a simple example. That's getting a glass of milk. So part of what I think the learning for all of us, certainly for me in this, is, is that so many of the things we're asking children and adult, adolescents to do have lots of little pieces built into them that we just assume. We just assume. Um, so it's really interesting to follow this through and imagine what would happen um, if he goes off on one of those other paths. Executive functions are formed both with biology and, uh, and with experience. So I want to talk for just a couple of minutes about the biology side, and then we'll spend the bulk of the time on the experience side. You saw in the video that we uh, learned about in terms of Harvard, this whole idea of uh, growth and pruning. So when babies are born, their brains are about 13 ounces. And when they become an adult, our brains are roughly about 3 pounds. So there's quite a bit of growth that goes on. They're pretty hardwired for all the things we need them to do. And then as they grow, these brain cells, which we call neurons, grow and grow and grow. And then there are two different times in their life, early around 5, age 5, and then again in early adolescence, where there's a lot of growth and then a lot of pruning back. The pruning back is a s partly survival. It's partly because we want the most efficient brains going. Um, and there's a bit of a use it or lose it philosophy that happens with these neurons. And so you have kids who are going through these processes of developing neurons through new experiences. 
and then pruning back, and then developing and pruning back. And the point around this is that the last place in our brain to be fully mature is the prefrontal cortex. And that happens for a couple of reasons. It's some of this pruning, it's something else called myelination, which sort of starts at the back of your brain and finishes up here. And so that prefrontal cortex, where they said a lot of the executive function is based, it's not exclusively there, but it is based there, um, is the last to mature, somewhere in the early to mid-20s. That voice of reason matures. Some of you may know people for whom that has never actually matured. <laughs> But most of us, that's when it happens. And so we've got these children becoming adolescents, becoming young adults, who are still going through quite a bit of the processes in their brain to fully, fully develop. <clears throat> so just to think for a second about, well, what then do these frontal lobes actually do? One of the things that they do is to direct our behavior. So if a 10-year-old comes into the family room and sees his brother watching TV, he wants to watch it with him, but he decides, you know what, I better go and actually do my homework first, because last time I didn't do that, dad was upset. That is your frontal cortex making a decision to go and do something else, right? Um, what else does our frontal cortex do? We are linking behaviors from the past and bringing them into the present. So say an 11 or 12 year old girl remembers that last week when she tidied her room, her mom took her and a friend out for pizza. So this week, having made that connection with her frontal lobe and memories, she thinks, hmm, maybe if I clean my room, we might be able to do something fun like that again. That's happening in your frontal lobe. Helping to regulate emotions. So if a mom tells a six-year-old you can get a new video game at the store and they go, and guess what? The store is sold out. And the mom says to the little boy, it's okay, we'll try another store. We'll see if we can, we can get this. When that little boy decides not to throw a temper tantrum, he's inhibiting sort of his natural uh, frustration or not exhibiting it in a tantrum-y way. It's regulating the emotions. That's the prefrontal cortex. And finally, um, you know, if there was a student in uh, senior school who didn't get to go on the class trip because they didn't have their permission form in on time and off went the bus for that half day trip to Chinatown. And the next time that student is packing their backpack the night before making sure they have their forms so that they aren't going to miss the trip. So it's making those connections and fine tuning as we get feedback along the way. Those are the sorts of things that our frontal lobes help us to do. So how do these develop? On the form, the sheet that I gave you that you were reading from earlier, um, the very first page really goes through, and I, don't, I won't take time to read it all here, but it goes through sort of each of the different uh, executive skills and sort of what they are and then what they might look like developmentally at different ages. So we've tried really hard here to reach across the, the different ages and stages that we're going through. So you can see that they develop as they make their way through. Infant research talks about the fact that um, response inhibition, working memory, emotional control, and attention all develop really early in about the first six to 12 months of life. Attention control, when a baby can see something and they're going for it, they're focused on it. This shows up even more, actually, when they can walk toward it, right? You see that more demonstrated. Um, you can see flexibility in a child's reaction to change between 12 and 24 months at first, the first. Um, some of us are still not flexible with change. Um, but that's where you start to see some of the, uh, the development of that skill. Other skills like initiating tasks, organization, time management, some of the ones that you put over there, those start to emerge later usually preschool to early elementary, and then all the way through. Um, the other interesting piece, and I think it's at the bottom of that handout, is if you can understand functions. So when you look at this little chart, I've divided those skills into thinking or cognition skills and behavior skills. Some of them are more leaning to the side of behavior, some more to the side 
of uh, thinking. And sometimes that's helpful information as parents when we're working or helping our children to understand, is it their thinking that we're trying to help or is it a behavior we're trying to shift, right? So if, you're, if your child struggles with memory and you want to help him um, to think of ways to try and remember things, strategies for that, that's more of a thinking, not entirely, but more of a thinking. Um, if your child is impulsive and struggles with sort of that inhibition of emotion and, and lashes out physically and hits people, then perhaps it's more of a behavioral piece that you're wanting to help them with. So it can be one or the other. The reality is that we often are working with our kids on thinking because how we think really governs how we behave. And so thinking is a really powerful place to land there. So we said that executive functioning skills are built with um, the biology of it, but also the experience. And I love this. This is like, what, we, what do we do as parents? We lend our children our frontal lobes. So when you go home tonight and you're chatting and you're saying, okay, tonight I'm just gonna loan you my frontal lobes, I think it's time for you to go to bed. <laughs> that's, that's you loaning them your frontal lobes. In the early stages, we're entirely their executive functioning. You know, as babies, we organize everything for our children. And then they start to develop, and we start to support them. And, and our behavior and the way we speak, they start to mimic that and take those on. Sometimes, you know, you say things out loud, and then your child starts to even just say those things in their head to, to remember what it is they're meant to do. That's really you sort of modeling the frontal lobe skills and the child taking it on. Eventually, it becomes an internal voice for them, which is really neat. So the executive functioning skills then, we see it as a science-based idea that has a bunch of skills, many of which you've named, that is a combination of development between the biology and the, and the growth and development of neurons and between experience. So there, knowing where we stand together as parents in this, I think is a really important piece. Um, it's really hard to assist your child with some of their organizational skills or whatever it is that shows up for them if you don't have an understanding of your own strengths and challenges within this spectrum of these skills. Uh, because, and we'll talk for, uh, shortly about some of the implications. If you're strong in something and your child's weak, or if you're both weak, what does that look and sound like? So we'd like to, uh, I'd like to actually give you a bit of a questionnaire to do in a minute and then you're gonna have a chance to sort of reflect on that. I was chatting with one of our, my colleagues today and uh, she's done the parent questionnaire and then she um, had the book. So she had done, three, she has three children and she had worked through the, because the, there are some children's ones out at the back that you can pick up when you leave tonight to do with the different age children. And so she'd worked it through with her children and she noticed that the one child that she was having a lot of, you know, um, tension with, uh, he, this child, was not very good at emotional control, right? He's quite an emotional child and just saying what he thinks. And she noticed about herself that she struggles with flexibility. She likes it all to just be like this. So you can start to see what happens in that context. But knowing and understanding what's going on just gives so many more options, you know, instead of, you know, you're making me crazy child, which may still happen, but there's also those options and thinking about why is this actually happening? Wow, interesting. This is what's going on for him. This is what's going on for me. Maybe it's time to get somebody else involved to help out in this moment or whatever, parent, other parent and so on. So what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to pass out these questions. It looks like a big test, but don't worry, it's not. Um, just take one and pass it along. If you need something to write with, I have pens as well. What's a big full row? There you go. Oh. Thank you. Well, so Laura's coming down with some, so that's why.
You done? You have some extras there? Awesome. Did you not? Okay, awesome. Thank you. You guys want to? Okay. You got, did it come to you? Not yet. Yeah. You good? Yeah. 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 So what I'd like you to do, we'll just take a, you, this won't take long, it's two little pages, but I want you to be, try to be, you, you won't be asked to stand up and share, hello, my name is, and I scored, no, we won't be doing that. But what I do really want you to do is to do it as sort of honestly as you can to provide the maximum opportunity for your own reflection on this piece. Because we're going to build on this for the balance of the session. So are there any questions about what you need to do? You score yourselves, and then you add the scores, and there's a key at the end that'll tell you magically. Yes, you're right. The last uh, point on that, thank you, I didn't catch that typo, starts with strongly agree. And then it, and that's a five, and then it goes down the bottom, should say strongly disagree. So I just want to, after you've done that process, um, to remind you of the rules. We're not judging, we're not, you know, it's, it's just good information. One of the things that I believe strongly in and I talk a lot to teachers about is that awareness is a real gift because with awareness comes a ton of choices that if you're not aware, you don't necessarily have. So as we go through, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how your strengths may or may not line up with your children's. And at the back when you leave tonight, you'll find similar little um, quizzes by age. So kindergarten, grade one, so on, all the way up. Please feel free to take uh, one of the quizzes or whatever. You signed up online of the ages of your children, so we tried to uh, gear it that way. So please feel free to take the age-appropriate um, little quizzes at home and look at them and see whether it's something you might want to have a conversation um, with your children about. What I don't want is sort of this massive over-testing, everybody getting anxious because, you know, I tried that thing. And I, I think we want this as one piece of information to see, what, to see what happens. A number of the students in the senior school who are working in the Learning Resource Center have done the teenage one and have brought it back and looked at how it corresponds um, with their IEP. And there's a lot of correlation. Uh, that's what the teacher was telling me today. So um, I think it could be a really positive, useful tool. And remember, it's, it's just a tool. So we don't, we don't want to sort of um, overdo that. All right. So how can you tell where your children's skills are at? Well, I've said we'll provide you a tool. Also, please don't take the whole entire continuum of your child's growth in tools. <laughs> Just take the ones that are relevant for now. Um, but some other ways that you might be able to tell. Is your child meeting the expectations at school? Um, and if your child's being successful at school, they juggle a lot in this school, our children. <laughs> I think they have super duper executive functioning lots of the time. Um, but if they're doing, you know, getting decent grades and doing the homework and managing all the various commitments, they're probably fine. And so that's great. You just keep going on and, and working through the things as we do with parents. Um, sometimes children do really well at school and worse at home. What's that about? That seems so unfair to us at home. Um, <laughs> but there are many reasons for that. Home sometimes is less structured than school. Home sometimes is a place just for kids to let down. Sometimes there's more stressors at home, like a little brother that drives a child crazy or something, you know, that, that is annoying. Um, or sometimes the expectations may be out of sync with the development. There are a variety of reasons that that can happen, but, but sometimes it does happen. Um, just as we don't expect all children to walk at 12 months, we don't expect everybody's executive function to develop exactly at the same time. It's a, it's a continuum, as I said. OK, so we want to talk about um, fit. You now understand some of the strengths that you have in your executive function. So what happens when your strength meets a potential weakness in your child? <laughs> what does that look like? What does that sound like? <laughs> what are some of the things that you can do? Um, so there's ways that you can help your child. Um, 
if you can get your child to agree with you that you have strengths and you can support him in his weakness, um, and that may be easier or not depending on the children. Uh, with teenagers, I don't even know if I would try that. Uh, because that's just not a place to go. But, you know, with the younger child, you can say, listen, mom's good at this, you're good at that, why don't we try to help each other? Th you know, that would be a possibility. Um, you want to be creative in using your, your skills to enhance. So sometimes you might have to be subtle um, or even downright sneaky. If you, if you have a child, for example, who maybe is struggling with organizational skills, but they're very artistic and visual, they love colorful things, you realize, well, if I were to get this child organized, we could use maybe some colorful bins at home for stuff to be put away. We could use a sticker system that's bright. We could do a, a variety of things that are visually pleasing, engage your child, go on a little shopping spree, buy the various things, set the system up together. It's just an idea. But the, the principle behind that is what can you, how can you use your strengths to support your child's weakness in a way that might engage them or link to something they're also strong or passionate about? Um, making a point of where you think you're weak and your child is strong. So, so sort of noticing, you know, last week when those plans changed, Man, I didn't like that at all, says the mother. That really threw me off. I was so looking forward to going out to dinner with grandma and grandpa. But you, you handled that so well. You must be really strong. You know, and, and that conversation where you can notice that your children have a strength in a place that maybe you don't. It's modeling. It's a way to sort of encourage them. When your weakness meets your child's weakness, I have a picture of laughter up here because I think that's a really big... <laughs> Uh, piece of it. Understanding um, what happens when we both aren't good at certain things. So if you're going to um, set something up where you want to do a task together and neither of you, we're going to go out, we're going we're to organize this room, the two of us, we're going to get it all organized and um, parent doesn't have really great desire or strength in organization and neither does child, it's going to be a tricky time to try to get it all organized. And so you want to be able to know that and, again, either call somebody else in or sit down together and go, man, we both don't know how to organize very well. <laughs> is there a video we could watch on this? Um, is there a way that we can set this up so that it can work better? Um, the idea, too, sometimes this can be really great, right, because you're both in the same place learning together. If you have something that you've struggled with and it's shown up in this quiz tonight or in other areas, um, before you get too stressed about your child not having that either, look at where you are. Like, you're okay. <laughs> you got here. You're fine. So, so it's about just trying to also put it all into perspective. You made it into adulthood. <laughs> Parented. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to do is uh, just spend a couple of minutes. In your package, there also were some... Let's sort of start to look more specifically at some scenarios. Right near the back, there's something that says case studies. So there are three case studies there. Here's what I'd like you to do for about the next five minutes. With the people close to you, I'd like you to figure out one of them that you want to read. So two or three of you agree, I'm gonna, we're going to read number one, or two or three, it doesn't matter. Then after you read them, I want you to talk about and look back at your list and say, what are the executive functioning strengths that are showing up in this? Like, what is the child demonstrating? What are some of the challenges? And then any advice you might have for a parent of this child. Is that clear? Um, I hope that you were able to identify some of the executive functioning strengths and some of the challenges and make some suggestions. I'm not going to use the time tonight to go through those three. I've got a few strategies I want to leave with you. Um, and really, that was, a, that was a, and a chance for you to spend time in this room really looking and wrestling with all the different executive function skills and sort of think about those so that when you leave here, it's in your brain. You don't have to do the homework. So good job on that. And we're going to just skip the timer. So I want to.
I want to let you know that as we go forward, my vision for this will be, tonight we laid the groundwork. Tonight we talked about biology, we talked about experience, we looked at what are the executive functioning, are they thinking, are they behavior, when do they develop. I hope you'll look at your handouts because it breaks down by age some of the things you might expect in terms of actual executive functioning skills. And when you flip over that sheet, there's a whole side for teenagers of the various things we want them to do and the different executive functioning skills that those require. So we're going home tonight with, a, I hope, a really great foundation. Where I'd like to go um, next time we meet in November is to start to really dig into some of these more common, I want to say, executive function skills that our kids need and that we see they might not have. Um, one of those I might think off the top of my head might be sustained attention. I don't know if you notice that at home or not. but Or, or management of time or management of organizational um, stuff. But you'll identify those for me tonight when you leave. And so we'll come back together, we'll spend a bit of time together, and we'll also have time to talk in smaller groups more focused on the age of our child and the executive function and some strategies with that as well. Okay, just so that you know where we're, we're going. Um, but anything, the very back page of your um, package tonight is a ticket out the door. Doesn't actually mean you can, <laughs> doesn't mean you can't leave if you haven't filled it out. But, um, that's going to help me get some feedback around where you want to focus and also to, to think about um, any suggestions you might have going forward. Before we look there, though, I just want to leave you with seven strategies to take home as you go tonight, OK? So if you end up taking home one of these little quizzes and you do it with your child and you're talking and you, you notice that your child has an executive skill weakness, in a certain area, watch and listen to their reaction to certain tasks because often you'll hear in the resistance, you know, a child who struggles with task initiation, getting started, might actually be complaining about having to write in their journal because they just can't seem to get that started. So you can start to make some of those connections and then have a conversation about what's really going on. Not that he hates writing, but just that he has a hard time starting or coming up with ideas or whatever the thing is. Um, when your child is trying to avoid an activity, consider the possibility that they can't do it. And one of the things that makes it really tricky for our kids when we as adults, teachers or parents say, oh, you can do that, it's easy. If the child's already sitting in a place of feeling like they can't do it, it's easy isn't all that helpful. I don't know if any of you have had that experience when you're trying to learn a skill. For me, it was golf. You can do that, it's easy. Are you kidding me? <laughs> So, so that idea of just really trying to uh, think, if you have the temptation in your head to say it's easy, what might be happening is it's one of your strengths showing up against a place that they're not strong. And that's just a good thing to notice. Maybe bite your tongue and then address it as you feel you should. Um, and find, uh, figure out what executive skills the task requires. And then ask if the child has those skills. None of this is about letting our kids off the hook. I want to be really clear. In the past, we've talked about grit. We've talked about growth mindset. Those things are still at play. What this is about is helping us have better conversations with our kids about what actually is going on and being able to scaffold and support them to be successful. So if you think about something like what's involved in room cleaning, there's task initiation, right? You've got to start it. There's sustained attention. You've got to stay there and do it. And there's planning and prioritization and organization. Those might be four skills involved in go clean your room, <laughs> right? So if you start to notice, where is the breakdown happening in that instruction? If, if it's task initiative, then you can say, OK, I need this done by tomorrow. How would you like me to give you a reminder? What's that going to look like? How are we going to negotiate this so I can help you get started? If it's um, sustained attention, then maybe it needs to be chunked a little bit. If you go in your room and clean for 10 minutes, you can take a five minute, I don't know. Whatever you figure out to organize. But if it's sustained attention, small chunks might work better. Um, if it's planning and prioritization, then you might need to do a little, you put the, like these are the three things, or it's developmental, right? These are the things, developmentally, wherever your child is, that you put away or that you do. And if it's organization, then think about some strategies to help with organization so that it kind of becomes a no-brainer. There are ways of scaffolding these things. 
Um, figure out if something in the environment's making it hard. So is there, a, if your child has struggles with focus and attention, are there things that are distracting them? And if so, what can you do about that? And actually, this is really tricky because some kids work better with headphones on and music playing. They stay more focused. My husband and I, as our kids were going through high school, sometimes they would sit at their computer with multiple screens open, with the TV on and the headphones on, and we would look at each other and think, what has this world come to? And we would say to our children, you can't be doing your homework like that. And they're like, oh, yeah, we can. And we're like, no. <laughs> so they said to us, listen, if our marks drop, then we'll turn the stuff off. So just wait and see. So we did, and they didn't, and so we let them do that. <laughs> but that isn't necessarily true for all kids, right? And so, and, and it, yeah, and so you, you can figure that out. But the other thing is, if your child's easily distracted, there's also internal distractions. We talk more about this when we get into focus and attention, but putting them in a room by themselves may not be the answer, <laughs> right? So you want to play that a little bit. Um, if your task can, oh, can do the task sometimes, but not all the time, you know, just because we can do something doesn't mean we've mastered it, right? And so we want to give our kids room to practice and get better and figure it out that way. Um, last couple. If your child has been able to do the task at some point, what was it about that that made it successful? We always want to look for strengths, like how did, why did that work well? Did it happen at a certain time of day? Did I use a certain tone of voice? Was there a certain reward? What was it that made that go well? And then just try to replicate it. Um, and if the child seems to have the executive skills to do the task, is the problem that they don't, don't believe they can succeed. And so there's a really big piece in all of this, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in detail, but the idea of confidence. Sometimes the task looks too big. It seems hard for them to break it down. Um, sometimes they've tried and failed at so many other things, they assume this is just going to be another one of those. And so they don't want to try. Um, or perhaps their efforts have been met with criticism in the past and they're afraid to give it a go. So in that case, you just you want to see if you can alter the task a little bit or to help them get started and say, I'm not going to let you fail. I'm not doing it for you, but I'll stay here available to support you as you go through it. Just like when they learned to ride a bike, right? And you were there and then you let go. Um, so we want our kids to not feel that lack of confidence. We want to help them find the things they're strong at and do well that way. Um, so hopefully, these, those, that's just a little overview of some general ideas. I really do want to dig in with you into some other strategies, and I recommend there are some resources here. I didn't make a resource list, but I will promise to put it up on the website, because there's some great resources out there that can, can help us with this as well. What I'd like to do then, just to sort of uh, wrap up, I'm hopeful that you're taking away one or two new ideas tonight. You probably want to think of those before you go so they can get crystallized in your mind. Um, one or two new ideas. To help you with that, there's uh, on the ticket out the door, I think it says what's one idea that sticks with you and one question you still have. Um, and it also asks you to rank those executive functioning skills. And then any feedback or suggestions you would have for me that would make this more um, Th that would make this a better learning opportunity for you. Thank you all very much. If you don't mind ripping off your ticket out the door and leaving it at the back, don't forget to pick up your surveys for your age-appropriate children. Help yourself to more wine. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you.